the Chicago Theater of the Air. by Marion Clare, conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFrandre, Mutual presents radio's greatest hour of music and drama, the famous Chicago Theater of the Air. Tonight's performance, The Countess Maritza by Emmerich Carmen and Harry B. Smith, starring Nancy Carr and Thomas L. Thomas, supported by Ruth Slater and the chorus under the direction of Robert Trendler. Ladies and gentlemen, the first few minutes of the Chicago Theater of the Air each week are dedicated to the history and principles of the United States of America, as reaffirmed by Colonel Robert R. McCormick, noted historian, outspoken American patriot, and distinguished editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. A year ago, Colonel McCormick delivered an address from the stage called Defining Democracy. So inspiring was this message that Colonel McCormick was awarded a medal by the Freedoms Foundation of Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. A medal for outstanding achievement in bringing about a better understanding of the American way of life. It is with pride that we present a rebroadcast of the actual awarding of this significant citation. Ladies and gentlemen, the transcribed voice of Mr. Don Belding, President of the Freedoms Foundation. Colonel McCormick, it is a great pleasure for me to present to you this award. For your talk, the responsibility in a free enterprise state, which was given on the Chicago Theater of the Air. The judges considered this an excellent presentation and was worthy of the medal which you are receiving. These are certainly times when responsibility have to be shouted to the land as much as is possible for us to do it. We have just presented a transcription of the citation won by Colonel McCormick for his great American address of a year ago called Defining Democracy. Tonight, Colonel McCormick will repeat this award-winning address, Defining Democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. The term democracy can be found in the dictionary, but that definition no longer means anything. It applies to every form of government, from royal government to communist dictatorship. It is used by some to create the impression that certain other governments are identical or very similar to ours. How exact this statement is may be traced in history. In feudal ages, men held land in return for certain services. The nobility was military service. With the clergy, it was prayers. From the feudal system emerged certain parliaments. The Parliament of Paris was reduced to impotence by the king. In Sweden, there were four chambers of parliament. The clergy, the nobility the burghers or city representatives, and the bonders, the house where freemen were represented. All of them had to agree to any law which made it very difficult to enact legislation. In England, the houses were two. The House of Lords, which included bishops and some judges, and the commons. The commons was not intended to represent the people at all. But the gentry or petty nobility, such as Oliver Cromwell, and certain cities. England, as we know, conquered Ireland and Wales. 
At the time of the American Revolution, the Union had long been made with Scotland, which abolished the Scottish Parliament. The British Parliament legislated for all of Great Britain and Ireland on every subject. At the time of our Revolution, the same families that occupied the House of Lords controlled the election machinery for the House of Commons. The famous commoners, Pitt and Fox, were responsibly sons of an earl and a duke. The famous Edmund Burke was a hired man hired for his eloquence. The thirteen colonies were founded under a variety of charters, ranging from royal colonies to proprietary colonies, feudal colonies, and commercial companies. There was considerable migration between them, setting up an identity of point of view. Franklin organized a capable post office, which facilitated intercourse. There were several efforts at colonial combinations. For a while, the New England states cooperated against the Indians. A plan of union suggested by Franklin was vetoed by the British government. Galloway's plan of union of 1774 was defeated by only one vote. Most of the colonies found a common cause in resentment against the royal governor and royal judges. All of them found common cause in resistance to parliamentary taxation. There was more than a legalistic dispute about the power of Parliament to tax the colonies. The differences with, with Parliament led to correspondence between citizens of different colonies and by committees appointed by the colonies. The non-importation agreement led to an organization to enforce it by coercion. There was a sentiment among Englishmen that they were superior to colonials, a sentiment which exists today in England and is accepted by the English populations of her colonies. It was accepted by the great enthusiasm by the Tories in the colonies and is still widely held by those Americans who travel or trade with Britain. The Continental Congress appointed by the different colonies in declaring independence, established a number of principles new to the world. Among them, the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This extraordinary organization, with no other power than common consent, conducted a successful war, made alliances, and made a triumphal peace, recommended to the independent states to form constitutions for their government, which they did under the leadership of Virginia, incorporating bills of rights that differed from the Bill of Rights of Great Britain in protecting the citizens against their legislature as well as against their executive. The English Bill of Rights protected citizens only from the king and left them helpless before Parliament. The Continental Congress formed the Confederation. The Confederation in turn enacted the Ordinance for the Government of the Northwest Territory, another department in government, in that it gave people of conquered territory equal rights for the conquerors. The Confederation adopted the Constitution and sent it to the states. The philosophy upon which the Government of the United States was based was largely the work of five Virginians, George Wythe, George Mason, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. It was an entirely new form of government, borrowing nothing from Europe. The old principle of state representation in the Senate was borrowed from the Confederation. The principle of representation in the House of Representatives in proportion to the residents of the several states, was a completely original conception. To the principles of the Constitution was added one more by another Virginian, John Marshall, that the Supreme Court could hold acts of Congress in violation of the Constitution to be null and void. The new country came into existence 
in alliance with France and Holland. To the example of France's efforts are always futile to establish a responsible self-government. What is now Belgium was combined with Holland at the Peace of Vienna. The Dutch, the dominant element, treated the Belgians with great veracity, refusing to allow ships to sail up the Scheldt to Antwerp. Belgium revolted, and winning her freedom with the aid of France and England, adopted in larger part than any other country in Europe the American principles of government. England adopted the American system of equal representation, but not having adopted any other of our safeguards, has fallen into a complete popular tyranny for property, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are denied. Norway, having been forcibly annexed to Sweden, had obtained her independence and has forbidden titles of nobility. In the three Scandinavian countries, the rights of men are observed as they are in Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. What the Republic of Italy will turn into is too soon to guess. Our federal constitution has been copied in the Philippines with certain amendments, and our federal constitution has been drawn upon to those of Japan and China. There's one great fundamental difference between the government of the United States and all of the governments that have been modeled after it. It is that 13 states organized at the suggestion of the Continental Congress formed the Confederation, which sent delegates to the Constitutional Convention, and the Constitution was ratified by the states and can only be amended by consent of the states. Representatives, whether in the Senate or the House, are not members as in England. They are the gentlemen from Illinois, the congressmen from California. From time to time, the executive has tried to become the ruler. He has been resisted by Congress, not only in defense of its own powers, but by the members of their capacity as representatives of the states. At the present time, it is precisely those states which provide the electoral votes for the president, which are most devoted to states' rights. Elsewhere, where the disposal arises in the central government to overthrow the Constitution, there are neither state organizations nor state feeling to lead the resistance. Thus, the French Republic has been overthrown numbers of times. Little by little, all the rights of Englishmen have been taken from them. Russia never had more than a promise of representative government. What will become of China and Japan, nobody knows. These may be democracies, if you will. Our government is not. When Franklin came from the Constitutional Convention and was asked what kind of a government it formed, he replied, a republic, if we can keep it. His fears were not unwarranted. Hardly had the new government been installed when the Federalist Party sought to turn it into a dictatorship. The second president, John Adams, wanted to introduce titles of nobility. He was opposed and defeated by Thomas Jefferson, running out a Republican. It was when his party became a party of slavery that it took the name Democratic. Democratic may mean anything excepting American. The American government is a republic. Speaking from the stage of the Chicago Theater of the Chicago Tribune, has delivered his award-winning address of a year ago, Defining Democracy. Free copies of this significant address may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. This opening portion of the Chicago Theater of the Air each week is dedicated to the history and principles of the United States of America. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, the curtain rises on tonight's Chicago Theater of the Air production, The Countess Marissa by Emmerich Kalman and Harry B. Smith, starring Nancy Carr, Thomas L. Thomas, and Ruth Slater, with narration by Marion Clare. The Countess Marissa. <laughs> the gypsies in campfires glow, destined to live forevermore. Hark to the legend of Countess Maritza, her regal beauty beyond compare living alone in fabulous splendor, far away from worldly care. A great estate deep in the forest where gypsies roam by night and day. Welcome, gypsies. My gates are open, but let no nobleman come this way. 
Laugh if you will, but this my creed, never to sanction a royal swain. My wealth, not love, inspires their greed. Tis my fortune they would attain. So welcome gypsies with carefree song. My heart belongs to you alone. I join your dance. I share your joy. No other love will I condone. The legend tells that a stranger entered on the scene, his earrings set with silver bells, his cap with gold, his tunic green. He boldly spoke to fair Maritza, just beyond the other's hearing, spoke in manner confidential, softly spoke in tones endearing. My name is Bela Torek, my lady, gypsy prince from far-off land, separated by my people, 
kidnapped by a rival band. Destitute, I fled my captors, wandered far through forest dells, near again to see my people, forced to bid a sad farewell. Maritza brushed away a tear. Roam no farther, Bela Torek. All gypsies find a welcome here. The stranger took Maritza's hand. Thou hast both faith and beauty. To prove my heartfelt gratitude, I pledge my humble duty. The lovely countess smiled her pleasure. For your keep to compensate, Bela Torek, this your duty, overseer of my estate. The handsome gypsy bowed before her. Your wish, my lady, is my command. Then come, Zigoyner, the music calls. Let joy ring forth throughout the land. Love was dawning while the gypsy fires were burning. Her song was the song of Bela Tarek, sung in the campfire's eerie glow. 
come from the heart of Bela Torek, the gypsy song of long ago. Love's bewitching door, counseled by Manya, reader of palms. Manya, your judgment I implore. Read every line and tell me true. Is he the one I'm looking for? Okay. 
the Gypsy Mania's counsel. I would first read his palm, too. Till I find what there is written, this advice I give to you. the gypsy mania to Bela Torek employs her art. Thou canst not hide it, handsome stranger. Your palm reveals who owns your heart. I see a name. What name is this? What secret here? What hidden deed? Until the answer comes more clearly, the call of love I bid you heed.
now the ancient legend tells of Manya traveling far afield to where a prince in splendor dwells, his name in Torek's palm revealed. The gypsy girl asks many questions, their answers sealing Torek's fate. What news is this? She must make haste, or mayhap she'll be too late. <laughs> Back in the gardens of Countess Maritza, two figures stand beneath starlit skies, their arms entwined, their hearts as one, burning love light in their eyes. Countess Maritza and Bela Torek, unaware of Manya's scheming, counting the moonbeams one by one in love's eternal dreaming.
Anya's returning brings sorrow. We'll hope and joy be gone. But think ye not of tomorrow. Let carefree hearts be gay. Think ye not of tomorrow. Live only for today. gathered from far and from near, eager to witness this happy occasion, filling the air with their boisterous cheer. When happiness reigns supreme, pitfalls linger everywhere. To Countess Meritza and Bela Torek, the voice of fate through the trumpet's blare. <laughs> Behold, it is Manya, the prince by her side, choosing this moment to intercede. The gypsies now gather to cheer his approach, bowing before his royal steed. The voice of the prince speaks forth to the countess. Denounce this Tassilo, this noble pretender. This Bela Torek is but an impostor, seeking your fortune through your heart's surrender. <laughs> Thus, Countess Maritza learns of her folly. Her Bela Torek, a noble by station, has gambled his fortune a penniless pauper seeking new riches through this usurpation. No gypsy is he, this wandering stranger, seeking to capture this fair maiden's heart, but rather a wastrel, a hunter of fortunes, plying his trade at love's eager mark. This man is a count, Tassilo by name, Bela Torek, but assumed for his role of wandering gypsy, with love as his prey, and Countess Maritza's wealth as his goal. The countess is speechless. Her heart is struck numb. With trembling finger, she bids him depart. So be it, my lady. Your command is my wish. Though 
fate comes between us, I leave you my heart. Now I can look at the moon without dreaming, my friend. It's right or faint with good humor in dealing, it's smiles on me. Starting to sympathize last while they're gleaming, cause I'm not free. Now in the evening I sit very happy and all alone, not a care Parted, as the legend recalls, a castle of dreams vanished in air. Lovely Maritza, pining alone, memories linger in clouds of despair. Gypsy with more revelations. Hear me, dear Countess, tis writ by the sages, love is the ruler of both men and nations. But Manya, the Countess sighs in regret. What sage would condone a trust that is broken? What sage would condone a lover betrayed, a dream that is shattered by treachery's token? But hear me, dear Countess, the Gypsy speaks on. His palm has revealed but part of the story. Tassilo, the count, condemn as ye will, is master indeed of riches and glory. No pauper, this count, no man is his master. Even though he gambled for his idle pleasure, he sought not your fortune, dear Countess Maritza. Romance was his goal, your love was his treasure. The eyes of Maritza shine forth with new light. But what of the prince and the count's condemnation? What of the warning you read in his palm and your trip in behalf of his degradation? Dear Countess, the gypsy explains with a smile, the prince was your suitor, your fortune he planned. Through Tassilo's betrayal, he hoped for your hand. Manya, please find him and bring him to me. Tell him I wronged him and ask for his pardon. Gypsy or Count, my love for Tassilo, Blooms like the flowers in this very garden.
count, return to the scene of his ardent wooing, return to the arms of his Marissa, again my lady's heart pursuing. It tells of forgiveness sealed with kisses, of sacred vows neath skies above, of wedding plans and happy futures waiting at the shrine of love. It also tells of little Manya and much more than the palm displayed, of Manya's wedding to the prince while gypsies sang a serenade. Now if you doubt this tale of love beneath forest green and azure sky, be assured it's really true. So the legend says, not I. Conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFondre, the Chicago Theater of the Air has presented The Countess Maritza by Emmerich Carman, starring Nancy Carr in the title role, Thomas L. Thomas as Count Tassilo, and Ruth Slater as Manya. Featured speaker was Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Robert Trendler was in charge of the chorus. Interpolated in the common score tonight was the fifth Hungarian dance by Johannes Brahms. Performance rights were granted by the Century Library, Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, we would again like to call your attention to the opening few minutes of the Chicago Theater of the Air each week. In these dangerous, treacherous days of 101 isms, it is fitting, proper, and very likely a matter of life and death that we review the inspiring doctrines of our forefathers, that we affirm and reaffirm the historic people's government based upon trial, error, and the very lives of our forefathers. Our days of trial and error must be over through our understanding and endorsement of our ancestors' trials and errors. Our glorious republic leading the world since 1776 cannot afford to be led to slavery by greedy and uninformed opportunists, both at home and abroad. The opening moments of the Chicago Theater of the Air are dedicated to our American doctrines, past, present, and future. For a better understanding of our republic, we earnestly invite your attendance.
This is Lee Bennett cordially inviting you to next week's Chicago Theater of the Year production, the grand opera Manon by Massonet, starring Virginia Haskins and David Polary. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>